I've entitled the devotion this afternoon, Christmas, Why All the Fuss? Christmas typically is the largest economic stimulus for not just North America, but for the world. Just in North America alone, in the U.S., the holiday sales generate about $850 billion. And because of that, surveys were sent out to find out what's all the fuss about. Why are we doing this? It surveys indicated that about 85% of the entire population of North America is planning on celebrating some sort of a Christmas festival or family gathering or Christmas celebration. That's 85%. What is really strange is those same surveys indicate that about 60% of North America, in the U.S. that is, is professing born again. That means there's 25% of those in North America, in the U.S. at least, who are celebrating Christmas, celebrating the birth of God's Son, and they don't believe. That's strange. It's great for the people that are selling ornaments, decorations, trees. In fact, the average American spends 932 U.S. per, per consumer. $932. That works out to roughly 1,400 Canadian per consumer. This is not one person in the family. This is, if you have a couple, that's 2,800. That's average. That's a lot of bucks. Why is all this? Do you believe that this is just a, 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 an amazing gift to the retailers and the stores and those who are selling everything from luxury cars to uh, flat screen TVs? Do you really believe that this could even possibly been concocted by some telemarketers? It isn't possible. I can tell you by fact, because I was in the retail business for about four years. And let me tell you something. I appreciated the extra sales around Christmas, but I could never have calculated the kind of impact that it has on the nation worldwide. And I, there's nothing a retailer can do to make that happen because it's an enigma. It's a strangety of our world. It's as if God says, I'm going to ensure that my son gets a recognized celebration, regardless of whether you believe even God exists. In the, in the U.S. and Canada, about 10% of our population is professing atheists. And yet, there's way more people who are atheistic or who do not even worship as Christians who are celebrating Christmas. Why is this happening? I believe it's happening so that people will ask the same question. Why are we doing this? What is the basis for this? Did you remember growing up as a child and thinking about all the things that were going to happen when Christmas approached and getting really excited for the big day? I did. And I looked forward to the Christmas festivities, the turkey, the dressing, the tree, the decorations, but all those presents, that was the best. And what I've concluded is this. God has put a puzzle in the world for the world to figure out. And just as the Lord Jesus told parables, and he said those parables are not for everybody to understand, but for those two who are wise, who seek after God, to come to the meeting of what is being said. And so, the Christmas season is a parable to cause you and I to ask the question, why? I'd like to suggest there are five reasons why we as Christians celebrate Christmas, and I'll leave the question for those who aren't for them to answer. Why do we celebrate Christmas? Well, we celebrate Christmas because it was predicted it would happen. Now, think about it. 
A gentleman said there are eight serious predictions in the Old Testament about the birth of Christ. That he would be, uh, come from Abraham's lineage, Genesis 12 and 3. That he would come from Isaac's lineage. Now, you say, well, whoa, 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 whoa. If he's from Abraham, he's going to be from Isaac. No, no, no. If you read the genealogy, Abraham had another son by Hagar. And he also had another son, set of sons by Keturah. So you, you can't say that. The lineage is not exact. And Isaac, you say, well, if he was from Isaac's son, it would be easy. Just follow the lineage. No, no, no. <laughs> because Esau was born as a twin of Isaac, uh, uh, from Isaac's family, and because Isaac was, had Jacob and Esau, not just Jacob, but it was Jacob's line that was going to be the line of the offspring. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth said to Jacob, and all peoples of the earth will be blessed through you, Genesis 28, 14. And... This was found fulfillment in Luke 3, 34. But you say, well, surely Jacob, it's easy to follow Jacob's life, but Jacob had 12 sons. And the prophecy only applied to one son, and that was Judah. Judah's line, the scepter will not depart from Judah, Genesis 49 and 10. And it was fulfilled when we discover that Jesus is part of the genealogy of the son of Amibadad, the son of Ram, the son of Hezron, the son of Paris, the son of Judah. One chance in 12. He would be David's son as well. When your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will establish the throne of his kingdom. He is the one I will build for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. 2 Samuel 7, verses 12 and 13. This is fulfilled when Jesus, the Messiah, is called the son of David, the son of Abraham, Matthew verse 1, chapter 1, verse 1. He was also going to be virgin born. And that was found in Isaiah 7, 14. The Lord himself will give you a sign. This virgin shall conceive, give birth to a son, and will call him Emmanuel. And we find that in the account of Luke, the doctor of all people, the doctor who understood birth, records the, in, the incarnation process, the meeting, the announcement that the Holy Spirit would overshadow Mary, and she would have a, a she would have a child without an earthly father. And so we find that found in Luke 1.35. In Hosea 11.1, 1, we have the prophecy, When Israel was my child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. And this was fulfilled when Joseph got up and took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt and stayed until the death of Herod. And so he fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, Out of Egypt I've called my son that Christ would be born in Bethlehem, Micah 5, 2. But thou, Bethlehem, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me, one who will be ruler over Israel. And this was quoted in the account of Matthew chapter 2, when the King Herod was looking for where Jesus was, the king was going to be born, when the wise men from the east came to him, Matthew 2, 4 through 6. Now, a statistic, as one who was involved with statistics did the calculations for these eight prophetic prophecies to all come true would be the equivalent of 10 to the 17th power. One chance out of 10 to the 17th power. Let's explain it this way. It would be as if you took a man and went out across the state of Texas and laid silver dollars to a tune of two feet high across the entire state of Texas. And then after doing that, ask a blind man to walk anywhere in the state and to pick the right silver dollar. That's the chances of all these eight prophecies just about the birth of Jesus. Now, we haven't talked about his life. We haven't talked about his healing. We haven't talked about his death. We haven't talked about his resurrection. There are hundreds of verses in Scripture which account all these things. 
this is not just history, it's his story told in advance. We are trusting in the Savior, not just simply because he touched our hearts, but he also touched our minds and said, this ain't somebody's lucky day. This is real. This is true. This is fact. And so it changed the way we look at life because it was predicted. Secondly, it changed history. Every one of us has coins. Some of us don't have any pennies anymore. We don't have any cents anymore. Well, that was true before we had money. But, but, uh, but every coin, you look at it, it's dated 2022 right now. Soon it'll be 2023, Lord willing. But that's from the time of Christ. He changed the calendar. Every time you handle money, you know, the Americans have in God we trust. Well, we just have the calendar at the bottom. It says, this is the reason why we exist, because Jesus changed history. It's changed our strata of society. From the poorest to the richest, all celebrate Christmas. And it's made a life difference in each one of our stories made a life difference in me. It's made a life difference in each one of you who named the name Jesus is Lord. And so as we think about this mighty time, I would encourage you to share with those who are asking the question, why all the fuss? And give the answer. It's not about the money. It's not about the commerce. It's about the man who changed history. The man who fulfilled prophecy, the man who changed our music and has brought us together and has made a difference in your and my life. And may we go forth during these next two weeks or so and try to be honest with people. And when they say Merry Christmas, which many will, even the retailers, that's one of the greatest ways to get people smiling. And they will say Merry Christmas. We can say yes. We are thankful, aren't we, that Jesus has made a difference. Has he made a difference with you? Because he has made a difference with each one of us. May God bless us as we move forward during this Christmas season. And may God help us to answer that question when it comes up. Why are we celebrating with such a passion during this time?